I want to introduce Ruchi Saran. She is the, the co-chair for the Higher Education Consultants Association, more commonly known and effectively known, uh, affectionately known as HECA. And so Ruchi, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about what's going on with HECA and the conference and, and also make an announcement about the Professional Development Institute. So tell us more about the conference. Yeah, thanks, Cindy, for giving me the opportunity to talk about 2024 HECA conference in Atlanta in June on 9th and 10th. And I'm really excited as a co-chair for the conference, and I invite each one of you to attend. I joined um, HECA last year, and for me, it's been a great village uh, to learn and grow in my counseling uh, business. And I think HECA conference is the perfect place to meet that village and uh, network with over 200 professionals, people who are attending the conference. And we get to interact with uh, 100 colleges and learn about them, engage with uh, 50 exhibitors from the industry. So there's just so much of learning happening in those two days. And uh, we also have pre-conference uh, tours to uh, HBCU, Georgia State, SCAD Atlanta, and uh, Berry College. So we get to see the local colleges out there also and post conferences to Georgia Tech, uh, University of Georgia, Agnes Scott and Emory. Everybody wants to go there, right? And uh, of course, seats for the buses are getting filled up uh, pretty fast. So if you are interested, I encourage you to register soon. And uh, as you mentioned, we also have a two day PDI session uh, on 9th and 10th. And uh, the topics are student services and business practices. And uh, Cindy can talk more about it, but I did attend one online uh, PDI session with you and it was absolutely amazing. So I can't even imagine what it's going to be like if it's in person. So I, I wish I could attend it, but we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we also have 35 plus uh, educational uh, topics, hot topics like AI, digital SAT, IEC success and more which are presented by the industry experts. So it's a lot of learning happening there. And it's a fun environment. We get to meet peers and uh, you know new members and not so new members. And uh, we have Rick Clark from uh, Georgia Tech as a keynote speaker. So that's really exciting. And uh, Emory is hosting us for a closing. It's like, you know, what more can we ask for? <laughs> And it just gets better. We have 12 uh, diner rounds, you know, in that same vicinity. And that's the time we get to meet our peers and we socialize with them. And I think the conference is just a great place to grow these relationships and make uh, lifetime uh, memories and bonds. And uh, I think in my closing, I just hope to see you all there. And all the information is on the website. But if you have any questions, just feel free to email me personally or uh, on the, uh, you know, HECA conference uh, email, whatever works for you. And I really hope to see you all there. And thank you, uh, Cindy, for giving me this opportunity to talk to your members and this platform. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I can't. There's nothing better than somebody who's been there and done that to give that testimonial. So I love that we're already getting those in the chat. The links for both the PDI and the conference are in the chat. I will announce that we just reduced the registration fees for the Professional Development Institute. They are now $425. It's a reduction of almost $300 in the registration wow. fee. And we did that to encourage people to be able to come and do the PDI and then go on and do the conference. So um, we hope that makes a difference. We hope to see you there. And thank you to you. That's, that, that's a testimonial and information is what we all need. And anybody else that's had experiences at the HECA conference or PDA, PDI, um, I appreciate, Jennifer, that you already mentioned what a great experience it is. So. That's, thank you, thank you very much. And the links are in the chat. So, yeah. so, um, so let's look at and talk about the topic for today. So we're glad to have you here, Ted. And you've been doing the, the guide, your FISC guide for many years, but you started out as a journalist, right? 
Yeah, I, I, I was a, the education editor of the New York Times at, at, the, at that time, and I'd always wanted to be a journalist. I'd always sort of done that. And uh, when I went, I decided I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to work for the New York Times because it was the best newspaper. And I went and I, I t- had an interview to be a clerk, which or a copy boy, basically. They called them clerks. And they told me that I could have the job, but they weren't promoting anybody to any clerks to reporter anymore. And I didn't believe them. I thought that was sort of a stupid policy. And uh, within a within a period of about a year, I be, I became a reporter. You had access to the editors, so you could write articles, and some of them would get published. Uh, and then they attacked, they uh, signed me to the religion desk because I did have a graduate degree in theology, and I did that for about ten years, which was very exciting. A lot of, a lot of, it was post Vatican II period and all the rise of the cults and sects and things. But then after 10 years, they said we, they needed an education editor. And would I like to be the education editor? So I said, yeah. And then so I be, in 1985, I guess, I became the uh, education editor. No, wait a minute, 75, 75. I became the education editor. And uh, the rest is history. And while, while one of the stories that I was covering was the, the demographic changes in higher education, the uh, it, it was a time when the ba- the last of the baby boomers were f- were f- finishing up with college, and so enrollments were down, and college some of the colleges were beginning to panic about how are they going to fill the freshman classes, and so they began doing ex- rather extensive marketing campaigns, and I I I wrote about this for the Times. I actually wrote it for the front page and then for the business section and then I did an article for Atlantic magazine about it but there was a lot of just crazy stuff they were doing uh, there was well, I guess my favorite story there was a college in Indiana I think it was that was which is everything was absolutely flat and there was a huge rainstorm and a, a giant puddle of, developed in the in the central part of the campus and so an alert photographer went out and uh, got some students to sit by the side of the, the literal of the of the puddle, and it made it look like there was a lovely lake in the middle of the campus. And the, <laughs> he, he took this picture, and they ran it in the view book the next year. I mean, it was pretty fraudulent marketing, but anyway. But unbeknownst to the editors of the view book, there were a couple of students sharing a joint in the upper left hand corner of the photograph. <laughs> and this this was lost on the administrators, but it was not lost on potential students. So I don't know. I don't I have no idea to this point whether the uh, whether that resulted in the in a boom <laughs> in a surge of admissions interest or or whether it hurt their image, but Anyway, so there was a lot of crazy stuff that was going on, and uh, at that point, uh, the the only guide was was out there. College guide was the insider's guide, which was pretty casually done. I mean, it was a student publication, uh, and the the publisher of New York Times of Times Books, which was a publishing imprint at the Times owned at the Times at at that time, and. Um, he said, "You know, why not? let's let's come out with our own college guide." And so, basically, we we tried. The goal was to come to the aid of the students who were trying to sift through all this information and propaganda coming from the colleges. And it started out as the New York Times Selective Guide to Colleges, but it was became kind of controversial because I was saying things in the guide that I couldn't say in the newspaper, and. Uh, so at one point, the there was a professor at University at Syracuse University uh, who took issue with some of the things we'd said about Syracuse. And actually, at that time, Syracuse was not had not was not paying very much attention to undergraduate education. All that they were emphasizing the communications, the graduate programs, and and all that. So it wasn't a particularly happy place to be if you were an undergraduate, and. Uh, we, we said this, <laughs> and so this professor didn't um, 
took some umbrage with this, and he wrote to Punch Salzberger, the publisher of the Times, and said, we think this is awful that you're saying these things about in the name of the New York Times uh, about Syracuse University. Uh, and Punch wrote back and said, yeah, we agree, so we're going to take our name out. Uh, so this New York Times Selective Guide to Colleges became the Selective Guide to Colleges, and then it became the Fisk Guide to Colleges because I was still doing it, and, and New York Times was still publishing it as a as a book, uh, and so that's how that, that's how the Fisk Guide got uh, got created. So it was uh, it was it was fun, but it did create a bit of a commotion at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's an actually parent there. Syracuse, I don't know whether I can take any credit for this, but Syracuse did become a much more, did begin to focus a lot more under their other on their undergraduate programs. And so to, today Syracuse is a very good place to be a you know, for some students to to, to be a, an undergraduate student. So maybe maybe I can claim a little credit for making them shape up. But, <laughs> but and the the idea was it was a journalistic effort. I mean, we journalism isn't very complicated. You ask people questions and you write down what they say and tell other people about it. And that's essentially what we do. We send out questionnaires to the colleges and we send out and ask them to select some students to fill out the question, some student questionnaires about what it's like to be a student at the college. And then we we package it in, in, in a book. So it's uh, it's essentially a journalistic enterprise. So I still see myself as a journalist. I don't know what else I could be, but... Well, you certainly have that journalistic uh, approach and frame of mind and analysis aspect. But I think asking the students is where it makes it so differentiates it from any other guides or data or sources that even now people ha don't have access to a lot of that information. And so hearing the student's perspective, I know as a counselor, that's one of the things that really struck me when I was when I've been using it. So how do you choose the colleges to be in the guide? Or, you know, how, how well, do some we, make we the cut and some don't? Yeah, we have about 325 schools. It, it, when we first started, it was, uh, I think, 160 or so. Uh, and they're, they're obviously they're, they're ones that have to be in the most selective schools, the main public flagships, um, the, uh, yeah, you, the schools that people are going to want to know about. And that, that was maybe, there's maybe 100, 125 of, of those. But then I also look for diversity. I want some geographic diversity. I want a mix of uh, evangelical schools, Jesuit schools, um, um, schools fo uh, focused on eco and ecology. Just try to I try to, to, to understand some categories and then have some representatives of of of, of these categories so that there will be something in there for everybody. And um, and then there's a lot of it is just well then there's, there's some journalistic prerogatives that I exercise, schools that are just fun to write about. Because the th thing about American high education, what makes it so fascinating is its diversity. I mean, there, there's no other country that has the diversity of types of higher education. We've got uh, uh, language universities, private universities, public uh uh, small colleges located in the, in, out in the boonies. You've got urban mega universities, some public, some private. Yeah, so there's this incredible diversity about there. And the, the thing about the diversity is, which I didn't necessarily know when we started out, was was that that schools, even schools that look alike at first glance, have their own distinctive cultures. And that's what fun. So it, it, you, it's often look, they're often beholden to their history. There's no way you're going to undo the history. Yeah, and and so they have they have cultures, and the and the cultures are different from school to school, even if they, as they say, tend to look alike. Yeah. And also the interesting thing, which again I didn't know when I started, was 
that the culture of a of a college or university persists over over a long time. It's very difficult to change, and it's, it's often rooted in the uh, in its in its history, of, uh, of course. But even schools that look alike really have different cultures, and the and as I say, these cultures are persistent. So Vassar, when you would think that when a school like Vassar went co-ed, that it, that would change the culture, well it, well, it didn't really, because it was the the males that were enrolling in Vassar for the first time were not temperamentally, they were largely the same as the females who'd been there before all, all, all along. And so it was, uh, it was fascinating to see this. I guess the, the, the most dramatic example, my first incident, my, my, my first learning about this was when we were doing the first issue of the, of the edition of the guide, and I was doing the, the pen write up, University of Pennsylvania. And I um, was reading along with the student questionnaires, and there was an undercurrent of anti intellectualism, which ran through these student questionnaires. Now, these are, you know, open minded questions, open ended questions. They were just not, we weren't prompt, there wasn't a prompt for this. Uh, and uh, I sort of said, wait, this is strange. What's anti-intellectualism, this strain doing it? I mean, it wasn't the dominant one, but it was there and recognized. What's it doing at the at an Ivy League school? So I, I started doing some research and I talked to Vartan Gregorian, who was then the provost uh, at, at Penn and he knew a lot about academic history. And there was a uh, an anthropologist or a sociologist, I don't know which, named Digby Balsall, who had, see, some of you may have heard his name. He's written a lot about how the Philadelphia aristocracy and the Boston aristocracy de dealt with their, with their colleges. And what I basically concluded, concluded was that the, the values of Penn, uh, the, the things that make Penn distinctive today, this idea of uh, this it, well, what I realized was it goes back to the values of, of Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. founded the University of Pennsylvania. And he was a guy, brilliant guy, for whom knowledge was important, but it was also but knowledge for its own sake was not the idea. It was knowledge that, that could be useful and it was practical and and, and only secondarily and, and end in itself. And over this, over the years throughout the 19th century, Penn achieved prominence largely through its professional schools. It had the first psychological clinic, the, the law school, the uh, uh, <coughs> the business school, of course, at Wharton. And even though I grew up in Philadelphia, I had and I didn't realize that the liberal arts at Penn is largely, which is formidable, you know, was mm -hmm. largely a post World War II development. And so if you understand this context, you can understand that, uh, that, that what, what it is that makes Penn, Penn different. And so they, to this day, Penn is a leader in service learning and service research. And so there has been this pra pragmatism that's run through the entire 250 years of its, of its history. And so... I just I found that really really fascinating. It's the 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 the, the I did the, the what made the, the the responses of college of college students today to it on open ended questions would revert to the values of some guy who died two hundred and twenty five years before it was just amazing. But anyway, so that was that was my big learning learning curve and. So, but it, it means that when, if, if we, whenever we're adding a new co uh, college, uh, college to the guide, uh, we can, I, I want to understand its history. And, and I start with the premise that it's going to have a distinctive culture and that the culture will be persistent. And uh, I have yet to be wrong on that score. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. well, and I think that is one of the things that's enduring about what you've done and with the guide and using the student surveys, because it does 
the students are going to be much more candid in their responses. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, that's. Yeah, well, people say, well, how can you let the colleges select the students who are going to answer the question here? Well, um, to, if I were, the only alternative would be to say, like, we're, we're, let's go for the editor of the newspaper and the head of the, and the manager of the football team or something like that. But that's going to get a selective sort of kind of activist student. And uh, so I basically asked the, the colleges, and we only now, we have an embarrassingly small number of questionnaires that I want. Usually, we ideally about five, because we've had lots, hundreds of questionnaires over the years, and we're just updating them right up. Um, um, and, but and now I've lost my train of thought. But um, so are you getting? So it oh, oh like yeah. So I so I don't. It, 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 I I trust the colleges to pick students who aren't going to badmouth them. So that has that has protected me from misinformation, and I've never had a bad an incident where I got some blatant information, uh, bad information that I put into the guide. So it's. It's really been very helpful on that. But then also, are you how are you going to control what a college student tells you? Right. <laughs> I mean, they send the questionnaires back to me. There's no way that the college is going to control what they say. So I, it it's it's system work. I don't I don't try to justify it with social scientists because they tell me it's nonsense. But it works, and this is a journalistic enterprise. You you look for repetition. You don't look for specific you know, microscopic data. Mm -hmm. So the students send the surveys directly back to the FIS guide rather than routing exactly. through their college. Exactly. Yeah, and it used to be on paper, and but now, of course, it's all electronic. So people are asking if you visit the colleges yourself. Uh, I've been to lots of them, but no, that's it's not necessary for the met for our method to visit them. I mean, if you visit, if I go and visit a college, uh, I'll meet with the president. <laughs> He'll introduce me to a, a hopeful Rhodes Scholar candidate or two among the students, uh, maybe a couple of star faculty members. Um, and, you know, this is useful. And, and I get a sense of what the campus looks like physically. That would be the main advantage. And we try to have a description of that in the, in the guide, of course, at the beginning of each write-up. Um, and uh, I'll get a sense of the, perhaps the the, the 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 vision that the president and his senior staff have for the college, which which is useful because I'm basically I'm really interested in the uh, you know, academic trajectory of the schools, current and future. Uh, but it, it's it's still a, a snapshot, and it's much better to get the reflections of people who. Who, who, who've been there for several years. And our, our questions are carefully crafted. And although we're now doing some uh, re revising of them, which I can talk about if you want, but the, yeah. uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's better to get the, 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 the reflections, as I said, of the people who've been there for a while. And it's work. It doesn't, I, it, it's, I, I didn't have some grand plan and didn't, I, I talked to a few social, social scientists before I did this and said about how I might structure the questionnaires and they're, they're, they weren't helpful at all. So I just went with my journalistic and, and instincts and yeah, it's 42 years later, it's still going. Yeah, I think your instincts are pretty sound, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Not particularly original, as I say. You ask people questions, write down what they say, and then repackage it. Well, um, but you're telling people what the responses you're getting, and people are responding to that. So do you have, with the new version that's coming out this year, and I'm, we're going to come back to the survey questions, but do you have new colleges that are going on the guide? Do you have colleges that are coming off? How do you manage that part at, of the at, process? At this point, it's a pretty stable um, um collection. I mean, I, I would like to add some more, but you've got 325. My wife tells me the book is too big anyway. Uh, <laughs> don't have We don't have enough doors to use them for doorstops. Uh, 
And uh, so yeah, there are a couple, there's some schools which I don't think I should talk about, which I would like to include, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's basically a space issue. I, I mean, I've got 325 schools, there are 2,300 four-year colleges. So that's about 15, what, 18% of, of the total. And people write in and say, how come this school isn't uh, 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 in your guide? And I have to write back and I say, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good school. I, yeah, I would love to include it, but there's just space limitations. And, and I, I should say, when I was talking about the kind of schools that I, uh, um, uh, the ones that we, that we have, that there's some of the, some of the schools are just fun to write about and like college of college of Atlanta, the Atlantic, you know, there's absolutely no way that you would pick the college of Atlantic out of, of the 2,300 schools and say, this is a, this is a must inclusion, but you know, it's got 360 students, I think uh, on the main, on the coast of Maine. It's just a, a prime example of the, of the diversity and the richness of American higher education. So once you've read a bunch about a bunch of these, you 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 get an appreciation of this diversity of of, of American higher education. Uh, some of the ones I, I I've lost a couple along the way because colleges are closely. The, the one I really miss is Marlboro College in in Vermont, which was this neat school in out in the, the rural Vermont. And what I liked the best, they had a their their ultimate frisbee team was known as the Fighting Dead Trees, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I I I love to write it. That's the kind of thing you love to put in print, but I can't do it anymore because they've now been subsumed by Emerson. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's it's fun. You, you have to have fun, or otherwise you go bonkers. But, Right, right. And that's and that's also part of the whole making it a personalized um, approach and, and a journalistic approach. Yeah. So, I should also say we try to make the write ups literate. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it, it's not just kind of reporting a bunch of facts. We each of the write ups, they go anywhere from a thousand to twenty five hundred words, depending on this school. But we basically try to create an essay, and there's a structure to it. You start out with a lead, and then you talk about the academics and and the and the geography, the physical plant, and the dorms and social life, and so and so forth. So you can you can compare schools write ups because there's the same order we mm -hmm. we cover it. But basically, we we try to make it like a literate essay, and it. it I think this, this is in this in this respect we differ from some of the other guides. Mm -hmm. it, it is well written and it's been honed over a long time period of time. Not that it doesn't keep evolving, but anyway, it it's fun. I, I'm a writer. I like to write, and it's fun to you know, to get humor into it because colleges can also be pretty silly, <laughs> and it's fun to point this out. <laughs> Do you have an example of something else that was silly that you've been able to to write about? Well, well, the other silly thing I remember when we were first doing it, I got, we was talking about the demographics uh, changing. I think it was Northern Kentucky University that uh, got a marketing idea, and they decided that they put. Uh, they allocated some money for some scholarships and they printed out scholarships like a $500 one or a $1,000 one and they put them in balloons and some of the balloon. And the idea was they were going to go release all of these balloons in, um, it was in a park right over the, the Ohio line. What, what, what would be the city right above, above Kentucky, not, not Cleveland, but anyway. Cincinnati. Um, I'm sorry. Cincinnati. Yeah, probably Cincinnati. Anyway, the, so the, the plan was to release these balloons, some of which had these scholarship offers, 
in them. And then if anybody came back with the lucky balloon, they could get cash in on this, this scholarship. So they, they actually never <laughs> got to go through with this because, first of all, some of the higher ups at the University of Northern Kentucky decided that this was not particularly distinguishable. <laughs> this was not a particularly good image. And then also, some of the uh, law enforcement in Cincinnati, they discovered that people were arming themselves with bows and arrows to shoot down the balloons. <laughs> and that there was, a, there was a threat to public health here. <laughs> and so it never happened. But it did get out. The UPI wire ran a story on this all around the world. So like, there's now people in India or Nepal or say, who, when they think about American education, think about Harvard, Yale, and Northern Kentucky. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, I love it. I love it. Higher education is nothing if not interesting. For sure. Well, it's certainly gone a lot more high tech since that yeah. day. <laughs> That's, um, but it is interesting. And Jeffrey Salingo writes about yeah. how yeah. um the marketing of higher education yeah. you know really transformed it in a lot of ways too and so to hear you talk about that and see yeah, that, no, he, that. He, he's a very perceptive writer i i, I applaud what he says yeah. mm -hmm. so in your surveys uh, the questions do you, so what are some of the types of questions and how are they changing so what are some of the questions you ask well, we ask, depending on this, well, we ask the obvious stuff from the university looking for administrative data, you know, on enrollment and acceptance rates and all that. For the, for the students, what I'm basic, I mean, the whole point of the, of the, of the, the write-ups is to tell what, what the campus culture and what it's like to be a student. I mean, that's essentially the question that I meant just runs be, behind all, all of the write-ups. What is it like to be a student at this university? So you ask obvious things like the academics, the core curriculum. And and I really make I really emphasize talking about the core the academics because it could, it's so easy to talk about other things in college. And ultimately they are supposedly anyway academic institutions. Uh, uh, and so I, I'm very careful. What I always have the what, what's the core curriculum, yeah, and then what new programs and all have they said? Then the obvious stuff for students: the the the, the, dine, the, the dorms, the uh, the dining room, the social life. Do you have to belong to a Greek organization to have a decent social life, or can you be uh, independent? Uh, and again, the the. The, po the point is to capture the different cultures of the, of the various schools. There, there's been some, um, and we asked them, "What's your?" We asked them, for, "In what ways are you critical of your institution?" Are the things that we ask about support services, uh, job counseling, but uh, and then uh, more recently, we've been asking a lot about mental health facilities and. Uh, in the in the and there's been some evolution in the in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s the um, there was a lot of concern about campus safety mm -hmm. but, uh, we we started asking a quick question about that uh, and later after a while then the whole issue of sexual assault and how do you handle that how the colleges are handling that that became a big issue. Uh, and as I said re more recently, there's been concern about, uh, about social, about uh, mental, mental health issues and ca and counseling services. So we've uh, we've asked questions. It's it's a little hard to get specific, good, usable answers out of a question like that. But basically, there has been an evolution of the kinds of things that people want to know about about the campus. Well, and and we're looking at a different generation. The concerns and things that Generation Z is looking for are different from millennials or Gen X. And right. so yeah, you know, exactly. seeing those questions evolve, and you were yeah. talking about the also just what is their impression on the value of higher education? So yeah, yeah well, that yeah, that's a whole issue. I mean, if you talk about the things that are going on now, because people really are uh, thinking about that. Uh, um, 
And so um, we're one. It, we're we're going to be making some significant changes in, in the questionnaires and then for the next for the not the edition that came out coming out in June, but the next one. Uh, we want to try to make it shorter and more succinct and not not ask questions that we don't really get usable responses for. Um, but um, the whole question of the value of college is yeah, what what is raising questions like what what is an educated person? Uh, and in a, in a way, we've always tried to get at this. And when you answer the, when you look at what the core curriculum is, that tells you something. Uh, but what is the purpose of college, and what is what, what's what's the goal? So we're going to start asking a few, trying out some new questions. I mean, we've always done some evolution, but uh, we're it's like we're going to ask student ask colleges, what is your definition of an educated person? And, uh, we are asking, we're going to ask students, what's your definition of a successful college experience? What What is the value of an education? We're going to ask students, has, have the college, what is your, what's your, what were your expectations and has, has the college met your expectations? So we're, we're going to start tweaking the questions, but all of it, it goes back to the fact that there's, it is this questioning of, of, of the value of education. And I think that's a really important aspect um, that not only are students wrestling with, with parents are as well, and how that yeah. is changing, like how education exactly. is changing. Exactly. This is exactly the point. I, one of my good friends and my good friends is Howard Gardner. You know, the mm -hmm. developmental psychologist. He's the one who came up with the idea of uh, uh, multiple intelligences, which you probably are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And he just, a, a year or two ago, he completed a five-year study trying to get at the question of what's really happening and what are the real issues that people are thinking about on college campuses. Uh, and this was, I guess he finished it up right before COVID, but uh, and he expected the questions to be like, it, it, college is too expensive. It's, you know, and uh, things like practical things. And he was absolutely, and he he he, he did his research. He, he, he interviewed, he took about 10 schools and he, uh, 10 schools, everything from uh, selected privates to, 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 to your co community colleges. And he uh, and he uh, interviewed students, faculty members, alumni, uh, staff, uh, administrators, um, and just a, 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 way, a, a whole range of stakeholders. And and he the, the the common theme that was that ran through all of these responses was that mental health is the biggest cut biggest problem facing American higher education. And this was alumni and trustees, not just students and, and faculty. And so uh, he was, as a social scientist, he was blown away by this. But it's also, and, that, and since then, you certainly read these you know, articles in the paper about this. Um, and uh, it's, uh, anyway, so we're, we try to, we try to get at issues like this. That's, that's a, that's a, an elusive one to to get at. Mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll see, but again, that it goes back to this questioning of you know what's what's the purpose of higher education, mm -hmm. and and that's a key thing to especially because the cost has increased. I mean, exactly. we're looking yeah. at breaking. 100k per year at some selective private universities within the next year or so and so you really do need to ask that question is what's the value for this for yeah, well, your family of no matter what their resources yeah so we'll see if we can get some meaningful responses uh jury's still out on that but but it's a good example of how the, the questions have evolved over the mm -hmm. years Mm -hmm. And and the changing emphasis, it used to be there wasn't a whole lot of 
concern or even recognition of the mental health and and now that has been evolving and i think it was really accentuated and exacerbated through covid exactly because, yeah yeah of yeah. course yeah you're right so yeah we'll be i'll be interviewing this summer a number of colleges talking about transition and the plans that they have to help mm -hmm. support students going from high school to college or even community college students, transfer students and such. So one other question Ted, we have for you is on the ratings. I know that's one of the things that I found very unique and very <laughs> helpful was having that way of comparison. So so it has how do you how are the ratings created? <laughs> the rating, the, actually the, the ratings with the fist guy is not all that important I, maybe i'd be naive about this but um what we we again we we were we're journalists and so the the models that my publisher times books said yeah we need to we need to rate the colleges so because that's what things do so we sort of took the model of the restaurant critic where you would admit award stars and various okay. candidates Mm -hmm. right, so yeah, again, it was this has absolutely this is totally the other end of the, of the spectrum for anything the U.S. news does. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so we originally had uh, uh, we're going to rate you star star system and uh, one to five, and for for uh, academics and social life, uh, and then we realized very quickly that maybe if you had five stars for social life, that might not be a very healthy <laughs> culture. <laughs> you know. So we added then a third category of quality of life. So we had uh, so and which we which we still have. We have uh, what is it? The uh, uh, pencils for so. If, um, uh, pe pencils for the academics, telephone for the social life, and stars for the quality of life. So, yeah, because and then when we originally used just stars, people were adding up. You, you, we didn't differentiate among the symbols at first. So people said, "Well, this is a this is a school that's got thirteen stars, and that, that one only has twelve stars." Well, you can't add social life and quality of academics together and have anything that, that's meaningful. So we said, oops, we got a, we got a new system. So I so I we ch changed to the different icons and you can't add a pencil to a telephone to a star <laughs> and come up with a number. So that that solved that solved that problem. Um, but I and I don't I I I, I don't rank it's important. I rate schools but I don't rank them. It, you can't get a one, two, three, four, five. I mean, you can compare, you can count up academic stars, but then the schools are going to differ in, in the other categories. So you can't really do what U.S. News so aggressively does. You can't just say this school is better than that because that's just, that asks the wrong question. Question is not what's the best school. The question is what's the best school for you. You know, I don't have to tell you counselors this. It's it's a question of fit and yeah you know, and, and and all that. So um, what we but I still wanted to give the, the readers some guidance. And so we it, what at least I like I like to think that the 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 stars and the telephones and, and all that we that we basically reflect the write-up that if you, once you read the write-up and again it's a it's a little essay about the school once you read that write-up you should be able to figure out pretty much what what this what the rate the, the ratings would be uh, again not ranking but rating yeah and uh, you may have your own yeah, everybody's going to have their own priorities and all. But anyway, so it's basically a, sort of a shorthand for using the the, the, the book. You might want to say, well, I, I really, I want to look at four, four and a half, five star schools. And so you can look through and it's a way of comparing schools. It's a shorthand, but it's it's not authoritative and it's not the, yes, the essence of the book is trying to get, to get at this campus culture stuff that we've been talking mm -hmm. about.
Mm -hmm. Well, I think for for me as an advisor, it was helpful because I could look at quality of life. It's not just academics. It looks like, yeah. you know, you, you know, it gives something to draw students yeah. and parents attention to because yeah. so often they get fixated on you know the name or the prestige or something. So right. it yeah. gives us some other elements to use. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. You're right. And you and you've also included a financial, so it has the icons for how expensive the the school is. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we have the 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 right. It's mainly what we say in the write up. So we don't have a publish a huge amount of statistics, but mm -hmm. there are some statistics that we put in the margin, including graduation rates and uh, uh, male female ratio and that sort of thing. So you have the financial information percentage. The, the, how how colleges rank rated well we have an index talking about how much where they rank in terms of average student debt of graduates and we just put colleges and publics and privates each in four different categories so there's some ancillary information that we pull together to to try to be helpful but as i said the the main point of the guide is the is the write-ups hmm. yeah we're journalists that's it. Mm -hmm. So, and thank it looks God like not, thank God we are not university administrators. <laughs> you know, the, the current admission scene, <laughs> and you're not having to throw out balloons out there with scholarships. No, 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 no balloons. No. <laughs> Try balloons um, out of there. So, I'm going to ask one more question, then I can see Carmen's got some other questions, um, but the overlap so that's another thing i know that was really helpful it's like well here's the school that has this quality of life here's the culture if you like the culture and this approach then yeah. here are some other schools you can consider yeah. so how does how do you create that how is that created in the book well we ask schools it's it's basically um, they, they all know look colleges compete in niches i mean every every mm -hmm. college kind of has its neighborhood and it competes with culture with, with maybe eight or ten other schools that, for one reason or other, uh, are, are offering similar programs. Now, it could be you might be in an, an urban area, but also be a small liberal arts college or so. So, if you look, and we just ask who who are your competitors, and in a sense, what's the niche you're, what's the neighborhood you're competing in. And you may compete with for different reasons uh, with different schools, but it's just a way of being helpful to readers. So if you're if you're starting out the college search and you got this huge book and you look at there's twenty three hundred choices out there, um, pick one that you like that you know you like, mm -hmm. and look at the what what are the schools that it competes with? What are its overlapping admissions? It, then maybe go one step further and do the overlaps of the overlaps. And by the time you do that, you'll uh, you'll have a list of maybe 20, 20 schools, and that's a that's a way to to get your search started. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just I love that it's a starter. It's a starter kit for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the data it sounds like is coming from the colleges themselves that they're sharing. Here's what the you know who who we compete applications yeah. with. So and you have to figure out what I mean like Boston College and Boston University. Uh, well, Boston College might compete with Boston University and Georgetown, and it competes with one because of the location, and it competes with the second one because it's a Jesuit school. So you, yeah, you have to think about it, but that's not very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So uh, it is difficult. You shouldn't be going to college in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother question, right? <laughs> All right. So we've got just a few minutes left. This is I this is so illuminating and I think everybody's really appreciated. Before we go on to the questions, though, I want to point out to everybody that um, there's a difference between being the writer and the editor and the publisher or the person, you know, the um, way that things are implemented. So electronic, online, iPad, all of those kinds of questions. Should those go to source books, um, Ted, or? Uh, no, if you have a question, just is. 
just send it to our uh, link, just uh, editor at fiskguide.com and we can okay. get it to the right person. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. cause those are things. We'd love to refer questions to other people to answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, so rather focus on content and just structure and that kind of thing rather than the the mechanics. So, Carmen, with that in mind, um, what would what last questions would you like to pose? Sure. So, um, this is all so amazing and interesting. Thank you, Ted. I'm curious what you make of the recent minuscule admit rates at some schools, which historically had generous admit rates. To your point, the schools themselves don't seem to have changed from 20 to 30 years ago, but the admit rates have. The admit rates? Yeah. Yes. The I, didn't, admit I didn't understand. In other words. So some colleges now have gone from like a 15, 20% admissions rate to like 3% admission rate. Yeah, well, basically, I, I think there, there are only so many, there's so many students and there's so many colleges and eventually it's going to sort itself out. But there seems to be a lot, college students are, are applying to a lot more schools. Mm -hmm. Maybe for, they, they, they need feel they need to do that because they need to get a good financial aid offer. And there are lots, lots of reasons. But uh, so that's why, so if you have more applications and you have a finite number of students you can accept, your rate's going to go down. And so it's... It, it, you got a lot of a lot of schools that have a selective uh, you know, single digit acceptance rates, but that's largely driven by the fact that people so many they have more applications because the same. But if you have a hundred, say say you have ten students and ten schools, and each one of them applies to ten different schools, there's there's still going to be one school for each student. <laughs> And and ten schools for each ten ten students for each school, so it's a lot of it. It's and, the, and there are good reasons to apply to more schools now. I mean, it used to be you'd apply to maybe three or four schools and a safety school and a reach, and that would be that would be it. But that's now, especially with uh, the financial aid so important, that's mm -hmm. that, that's long gone. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. And I think it points out that where we've evolved mm -hmm. before, um, where we've evolved to now, in the past, and parents and students in particular <clears throat> focus on the admit rate. Well, now we're at 3 and 4%. Yeah, you know, Some universities like Minerva, I mean, some report yeah. a minus percent. I don't know how they do that. But, but it's not the admit rate based on all the things you talked mm -hmm. about. It's the yield rate. And that's the thing that oftentimes doesn't get recognized. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot more questions that I know we're not gonna have time, but let's just give just a general, is there gonna be an electronic version? I know there has been in the past. A lot of people are asking about that. Is that a question to ask the um, editor? Are there plans well, for yeah, electronic we, version? We have had a, 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 a electronic version of it, but frankly, it hasn't sold. People seem to, this is a product where people basically want the book. You want to kind of have it in the car when you're tromping around visiting visiting schools. And and it, I'm not sure I know how to go about doing an electronic search if I did have it. You know, it's just yeah, it's sort of be sort of overwhelming. But uh, I think college, you can get, College Planner does have, they they you can get the access to an electronic version through College Planner. Yeah, but, and Maya too. Maya Learning, which used to be Guided yeah. Path, uh, or guide. it is still Guided Path. Guided Path through Maya Learning has it as well. Yeah. Because everybody, when they said, oh, we're going to yeah. not yeah. have it anymore, everybody put up objections, and, and Maya Learning said, yes, we'll, we'll bring it back. So... Yeah. That is, yeah. So, so there is, there is some, but basically, what people want is, is, is the book. I, I know that sounds strange in the current techno era, but uh, that's just been our experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of reassuring, right, to say that people still like that paper version and that paper option. It looks yeah. like Louise says Council Moore has this guide as well. So, yeah. Um, well, Gutenberg well, was onto something. 
Yes, yes. We're, we're glad it's still around for sure. Well, thank you so much, Ted, for being here today and sharing this with us. And um, so everybody, your new book comes out when and where June, can they June. go get it? Yeah, l last week in June, roughly, yeah. And do you need a new book every year? I see somebody asking Definitely. that. Every, everybody needs to buy a new, <laughs> new copy every year. No, <clears throat> it's... It, 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 as I said before, the cultures of schools evolve, but they don't change very much mm -hmm. from year to year. So you exactly. But on the other hand, colleges have, have a yeah. They they build new facilities. They start new programs, and so we we try, we up to. I would say I've never done this systematically, but probably fifteen percent of the write up changes every year. But it's topical things like new facilities and new new programs, and then every once in a while they'll come up with a with a new re revision of the core curriculum, and that's I consider that to be pretty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that that goes to the heart of everything else. So, um, are we going to see you at NACAC or any of those upcoming conferences, Ted? Well, I usually go to NACAC, but we'll see. I I I think I'm going to be out of the country during the next NACAC, but we'll see. Anyway, yeah, I, 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 I always enjoy, I always enjoy NACAC because it's it's fun. It's fun watching some of the some of the stuff colleges are doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it. And it's they have some good speakers. I mean, yeah. Wes Moore was terrific the last time. I mean, I missed that one, unfortunately. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you, okay, everybody. Well, thank, thank you, you all. Carmen.